Let's pray together. Father God, Lord Jesus, thank you for your word of life that we are opening now and um, for all of the promises that remind us exactly what was just sung about, that you are everything that we need, everything that we're not, and you give it freely to us. So I pray, Lord, that we would receive your word today in abundance, that our hearts would be open and we would hear your voice and we would feel the touch of your presence. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. We are continuing on our sermon series called Power in the Blood. And we're talking about how the blood of Christ gives us power in a multitude of ways for us to live our lives fully in, uh, in, in the Lord before he comes so that we can experience his power emotionally. We can experience it in our relationships. We can experience his power in our social lives, helping one another and serving our communities. We can experience his power as we grow spiritually. And so, again, our theme verse is from Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, which says, They triumphed over the accuser by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Now, if you're new here today, or if you're new watching online, you can go back to our earlier services in our playlist, and you can look at the earlier presentations where we've looked into this verse specifically, and we pulled out, who is the accuser? Well, who is the accuser? That's the enemy of God, right? That's the devil. And who is the lamb? The lamb is Jesus, who we worship today, and we are called by his name. And who is the they in this verse that triumph? That's you. That's us, right? That's us throughout time and throughout place in this world who are called by Jesus' name that he is coming back for. He's coming back for all of us. And so we triumph over the accuser by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. So again, the accuser is the adversary of God. That the, book, the Bible, the book of Revelation says, is that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, which leads the whole world astray. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. That ancient serpent. Well, today, I want to talk about what it means for the, uh, the accuser, the devil, to be called the ancient serpent that we triumph over by the blood of the Lamb. Because we're talking about trials and temptations this morning. And how we can experience victory over trials and temptations by the blood of the Lamb. Now, we've also been in a uh, prophecy seminar in the evening times over the month of October. And there are resources that you see out in the uh, foyer that go along with the presentations that are being made each evening in that seminar there's also some devo small devotional materials, and I didn't bring up an example, but there's one out there this morning. It's orange colored, and it says uh, the, the roar of the lion triumphing over trials and temptations. And so that goes right along with the message this morning, and if you'd like to grab one of those resources uh, when, before you leave today, grab a couple, share them with some friends. They're there on the resource table for you. But this morning, I want to talk about what it means for us to experience trial and temptation. Because we need to triumph in this area of our lives as well. And what does that mean to triumph over trials and temptations? So I want to take us back to the first story in the book of Genesis where that ancient serpent appears. So in Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 through 5, the serpent says, You will not certainly die. And he's speaking to the woman, the first woman created by God, and her name is Eve. And if you remember the story, God has put up a tree in the Garden of Eden, a tree of life that Adam and Eve have full access to. And it represents their immortality, their eternal existence and relationship, their undying relationship with the God who created them. There's also another tree in the garden called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And this tree, God said to Adam and to Eve, do not touch this tree. This tree 
is called the, knowledge, the tree of knowledge of good and evil because when you eat of it on that day, you will die. So this tree is off limits, but it's here for you to make a choice, a free choice. Whether you want to have life in life eternal in the home that I created for you, or whether you would like to not have any of that. And what we see is a serpent that appears in that tree speaking to Adam and Eve. And that serpent is the adversary himself. The one that has intercepted into God's perfect world to lead Adam and Eve astray right from the very beginning. And he says to them, you're not going to die. God is lying to you. For God knows. God knows. Your eyes will be opened. He doesn't want you to know. Now, God told Adam and Eve this very thing. But Satan makes it sound as if God is hiding something from them and they need to distrust God and make a choice that would be to listen to his voice. This is the first temptation. We've heard about the original sin. This is the original temptation. And preceding any original sin comes a temptation, a call to turn away from God and to entrust your very life and everything that you have to the voice of this strange serpent that you did not know previously. So, what do they do? Well, of course we know what happens, right? Here we are. We know what Adam and Eve did. You know the story well. Whether you are raised in a church or not, whether you have a church background or not, you've heard the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent, the devil, the snake. And it's not about the fruit that they ate. It's about the decision that they made. It's about who they listened to. They were ensnared that day by the enemy of God. What the serpent did on that day was to take authority, spiritual authority, of Adam and Eve's lives and own it. And in so doing, own them. They were caught in his grasp because they listened to his voice over and above God. The good news is, of course, that here we are today worshiping in a church because we know that that's not the end of the story. God did not let that be the end of the story. God had a part two. And then God had a part three. And then God had a part four. And we call that the Bible. And here we are today, and what part are you in with God? Because if you're still in the first part, you have a whole lot of grace left to experience. Me, personally, I don't know. I haven't been keeping count. Maybe I'm in part, I don't know, 36 or something like that. I'm not sure. But all of the chapters seem to conclude with me getting into a mess again. And then God starting the next chapter, bringing me out of it and helping me to stand again. Because it's always by his grace, isn't it? Well, look at what Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 says. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. So when we talk about this theme verse in our Blood of the Lamb uh, series or Power of the Blood series, what we're talking about is how God has the victory for us on our behalf over the accuser. And we're his goal. We're the ones that he wants to save. We're the ones that he gives his power freely to. And the original tempter, the ancient serpent, is thrown down or hurled down, it says in Revelation chapter 12. I love this passage of scripture. This is a victory passage. The accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. But you know, we got to look at that word again, the accuser. That ancient serpent, he's not only the original tempter, but he's also the accuser. And what's the accusation? 
Well, as soon as Adam and Eve and our forebears of humanity turn towards Satan and his authority in their lives over and above God's, as soon as they did that, Satan came forward with the accusation. These humans cannot belong to you, God, for even in perfection they turned away from you. And now they cannot help but to fall to temptation. Now, is that an apt description of us? You know, there's a lot of truth to the things that the devil says, unfortunately, because he is a master of taking the truth and using it in harmful ways to get us to do wrong things, always with a deceptive aim. But this is his accusation to God. He's not only lying to us, he's also lying to God. He says, these people cannot belong to you. And what is God to do? God's, what do you mean? You're telling me that they can't belong to me? I'm God. I created even you, Satan. Who are you to tell me that they can't belong to me? And he can just go, poof, poof, and then boom, and then do away with him, and then he can have us back no matter what, you know, just as, as, as easy as he, as he wants. But that's not what God does. Because that would be going against his character of just ending the life of a person without any openness or transparency or anything about a concern for justice. God doesn't do that. So he listens to and he bears with the accusations of the accuser. It says in this verse, day and night. Huh. Okay, so get this. Here's the picture. You know, we pray to God. A lot. We lift up our prayers to him. And we do it from each of our own homes throughout the week. And we're joining with the rest of our community, people that we know are just praying. Doesn't matter what your faith background is. We're praying. We're pleading for God. We're asking for help. We, we're, we're lost in the dark. All around the world, we're all doing this at once. All of our prayers are ascending to God on his throne. He's got the ability to listen to each and every single one of our prayers day and night. And at the same time, while that's happening... He's also listening to the accuser say, you can't listen to that one. You can't listen to that one. That person you can't help. You don't, that person doesn't deserve it. These, oh, they belong to me. And he's accusing, accusing, accusing at the same time, day and night. And God's got to listen to that too. The tempter and the accuser are one and the same. He's the one that wants to lead you away from God and to get you to distrust him, because guess what? That's what he lives off of. He lives off of your downfall. He lives off of your death. He lives off of your tragedy. He lives off of your trauma. He lives off of the, the, the remains of the human race. That's how he gets his life. And then after he gets us to do things that break our relationship with God and our connection to life, then he turns around and he accuses. He accuses us of being bad, not good enough, won't ever be worthy, not valuable. And then he accuses God of going against justice by taking any one of us back. Does he have your best interest in mind? No. He's only using you for his own ends, to own you, to possess you. But Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 says, he has been hurled down. God says, enough! And he casts him out. And the moment that Jesus died on the cross was the moment that the accuser knew that his days were surely numbered because he has no standing accusation to make anymore because of the blood of the Lamb. This is a fulfillment passage right here in Revelation chapter 12, and it parallels the prophecy passage. The prophecy passage is the first book of the Bible where we see that ancient serpent in the first place in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. So, what did God do after Adam and Eve sinned and gave their authority over to the evil one? He came looking for them. He searched for them. 
And when he found them, he discovered what had happened, as if he didn't already know. But again, he does things to bring everything out into the full light so that everything is transparent. Who has changed? What has happened? Who's at fault even? And it comes back down to the original tempter, Satan himself. He came and intercepted to get control of humanity. And this is what God says to the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head. Now, this is the first prophecy right here in all of Scripture. And I just want to pause here for a moment and say, are any one of us going to enjoy having Satan in authority in our lives? No, right? We don't enjoy it. We don't like what temptations hold for us. We don't like what trials do to us. If we could avoid all those things, we would. If I could uh, right now, this morning, say, I'd like to never be tempted again, I'd like that, wouldn't you? If I could put an elixir right here and say, drink this and you won't face any more temptation for the rest of your days, maybe I can make a pretty penny. Well, you probably report me to the conference office, and that's why I don't do that kind of thing. <laughs> All right? Um, but we don't like being tempted, and we don't like going through trials either. But we do experience them. And we know that we fail. And that doesn't make us say, yeah, I'm following Satan. That's my choice. No, we don't say that, do we? Eve did not say, I am now following this serpent. No. But she was left on her own. Her husband had thrown her under a bus, and she was now hiding in the bushes, and she was isolated from everyone that was important in her life in this moment. And the one that promised her great shiny things, here he is now standing in accusation. So God does something. He says to the serpent, he clarifies, she's not going to like serving you. There is no good outcome here for you, he says to the serpent. You're never going to win their honest, free um, allegiance because you always want to control and possess. And it's going to come to an end. There's a child that's going to be born, and he's going to crush your head. And maybe Adam and Eve thought that would be their first child. Maybe they thought it would be their grandchild. Maybe they thought it would be their great-great-grandchild. It wasn't. But one day he was born, and his name was Jesus. And that is why the accuser has been hurled down. The original prophecy came to final fulfillment in that last book of the Bible. And this is what the prophecy says, though, as God continues. This child's going to crush your head, but you will strike his heel. How do we triumph over the accuser? By the blood of the Lamb. Jesus was beaten, overcome by the power of the enemy when he was arrested and crucified on the cross. An innocent man who gave his life for the entire world in one of the most uh, horrendous abusive ways, the serpent struck his heel and brought his life to an end. But that's what sealed his fate. That's what made it possible for us to overcome the accuser. Not only the accusations, but even the trials and the temptations. Now, the Bible says this, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. You see, the original prophecy said, there's going to be a child, and there's going to be you, the serpent, and there's going to be a showdown. And this is where the showdown began to take place. Jesus had become human. He had born into the world. Now he's 30 years old, and he's beginning his earthly ministry. He heads off into the wilderness. He's going to face the devil and the temptations. 
He's going like back to the Garden of Eden. He's becoming the second Adam to face it all over again, rewinding the clock. And who leads him there? The Spirit of God, it says. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. What the first humans lost, the Messiah would win back. And having won this contest, because he did, he faced Satan, and he, he received the temptations, but he did not hand the victory over to Satan. Instead, he withstood those temptations, he endured, he had victory, and when he left the wilderness, the devil had empty hands. Couldn't do it. Couldn't get him. Couldn't deceive him. Couldn't get his spiritual power into my hands. The devil had lost. So having won this contest by Jesus, the rest of the prophecy was set in motion. The serpent is going to go for the strike, for the heel. Having faced the temptations, Jesus now faces the trials that are ahead of him. He's going to be rejected by his own. He's going to be arrested by the, the authorities, the spiritual authorities that uh, were in possession of the sanctuary and everything that was supposed to point to Jesus. They rejected him. They condemned him, an innocent man, on trumped-up charges, and then they murdered him in a public way. So, go to this next verse. James chapter 1, verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. That's great context, isn't it? Now, when was the last time you said that to yourself? Oh, joy! <laughs> so, there's a number of things going on in my house right now. And we were just laughing. Uh, oh, what was it that just kind of sent us over the top a little bit yesterday. But anyway, uh, you know, there's a number of things going on with our house that we need to fix. Being a homeowner, it's tough sometimes, right? It's all on you to fix it. <laughs> and our microwave stopped working, and our refrigerator went up to like, I don't know, 56 degrees or something like that. And, you know, we have people in our lives that are facing different things and challenges with their health and so on, and, and busy schedules and that kind of thing. And even with just that stuff, right? We, we, we were like, Lord, what's going on? What are you doing? We found ourselves in the midst of saying this all over again, you know? How often do we say this? Lord, what are you doing? What's going on? Right? And we read this verse, and if somebody were to like, come to us and say, hey, you, you're forgetting about this verse, right? In the middle of like you're feeling the stress and everything of it, and they say, remember what it says. Consider it pure joy. When you're facing trials, you're, you're, you're in heaven, man. No, right? So how could the Bible say this? What's the spiritual truth here that we're often missing out in the moment? Because I believe that there is the real spiritual truth here, that it's saying something deep and profound, that when we are in the midst of trials and temptations, we really are in a special place in our relationship with God. Well, I can't feel it beyond the stress and anxiety and worry and hurt and everything, but it's good to know it because it opens up a window for me in the midst of all of that to say to me, basically, this is not going to keep the light out. This is not going to keep God away from me. This is going to be yet another way in which God shows me somehow that he's got me and he's with me. Can I rejoice in that? I'm certainly not going to rejoice in the trial itself, right? But I can rejoice in that. Now, there's a couple of things here. First of all, trials of many kinds. Not only are we talking about a variety of tough things that can happen to us, but also the basic sets, two things, tribulations and temptations. Now, we know that there's some basic differences by what we mean by that. But the one and the same word in the Bible is trial slash temptation. It's the same word. The Bible only uses one word to describe both sets, tribulation and temptation. 
And it goes on to say in James chapter 1, verse 3, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So that window that God gives us so that we know that we can still have hope and light. When we're enduring trials slash temptations, we can know that the testing, or you could read the word tempting, of your faith produces perseverance. How do you know which word to read? It's one and the same word in the Greek language. Well, they had a way of understanding the difference, the elasticity of this term. Because James himself goes on to say this in verse, uh, what does that say? Verse, verse 13. Thank you very much. My classes are not helping me there. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Oh, wait a second. This is one and the same word. So you could also translate it this way. When tested, no one should say, God is testing me, for God cannot be tested by evil, nor does he test anyone. Oh, all of a sudden, that doesn't sound right, right? We talk about different tests of faith and things like that. And there's some examples in Scripture. It's one and the same word. How did they know? We have two different words for it. Trials, temptations. Why didn't they have two words for it? I don't know. But they understood that there were times there was a certain kind of test that God didn't have anything to do with engineering. And anyway, knowing that there's only one word for this, it clarifies something in our minds about how God works. Does God engineer any test? Or does God engineer the way through the test and your support system in the test and the value of that test that will come to you later on or in your life to make you a more experienced and mature and full and free person? That's what God's the engineer of. But the trouble itself, whether it's a trial or a temptation, James says, that's not God sitting up on his throne saying, let's see what we're going to throw Paul's way today. Hope he's ready. Let's find out. You know, that's not what God does. You know, that sounds like a lot like somebody else that we're reading about in Scripture here. We're talking about this showdown between Jesus and the serpent, right? And the serpent is everything that Jesus is not. So when we conceive of God actually designing trouble for us and throwing it our way, hey, you know what? That's more like the accuser, the original tempter, the ancient serpent. Because what we learn through trials of many kinds is that God is not like the accuser. God is not like that at all. When tempted, uh, oops, let me go on here. Got ahead of myself. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. The devil didn't make me do it after all. That might have been the case with Adam and Eve, but that can't be my excuse. The Bible says each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Now, that means that my trouble might be a temptation to do something that's damaging or destructive to me or to my relationships. Or it could also be a trial. When each person is tried or in tribulation, they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. I can't believe I'm having to go through this. What kind of God would do this to me anyway? You know what? I'm done with this. I'm not going to have any part of it anymore. I'm out of here. And my faith starts to, and I walk away from all my support system. Now, I can understand the pain and the trouble that a lot of people have to make that decision. Can't you? Because when we do understand it, it's tragic. It means there's so much noise and confusion that we have in our minds and in our lives that we cannot clearly distinguish who God really is versus the behavior of people in our lives. And that's hard. That's hard. If I'm going to be the kind of person that says, hey, pure joy, come on, count it pure joy, you go through a trouble. Look, 
you might get some sympathy from me, but not when I read this scripture in the Bible. You're preaching to the choir. You need to just buck up. Then I might become one of those people that does more harm than good and encourages somebody. You know, there seems to be two flip sides to this. Your trial that you're going through can break down your faith to say, you know what, I'm out of here. And your trial could give me the impulse to say, come on, what's the matter with you anyway? I sure would hate to be you. And I can be tempted as well and dragged away by my own evil desire, my own incapability of handling your tough time. It's not about me anyway. But a lot of times that's what we do. We do. We make it about us when we see other people going through stuff. Maybe because it's scary. Maybe because it's hard, too hard. It's overwhelming for us. I wonder what it could be like for them. I don't know. I can't, I can't even think about it. So there's a whole lot of bad that happens in here when we're experiencing challenge and trouble. And God's not the engineer of any of that, you see. The accuser is there to prompt it, poke it, and feed it, because he gets to live off the remains. This is the statement. This is what the accuser keeps bringing up. Hey, God, did you forget that these people, they keep getting dragged away by their own evil desires? You did it again, God. You forgave them. You sent your Holy Spirit. You helped them. You did things. But they're going to do it again. The accusation has two parts. These humans are responsible for their own stuff. And then, God, you act against your own perfection by holding on to them. Just let them go. And often we religiously side with the accuser on this one when we read this next verse. James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, each person will receive, that person will receive the crown of life. I want you to just look at that verse in isolation all by itself and you tell me what theology you can come up with. When you're undergoing trouble and you gain the victory and you endure it, you'll get the crown of life. It's up to you. And we have the tendency to look at this verse in isolation and believe it and think we have to live it. Is that what the Bible here is really saying? No. This is one verse in the entire chapter that James is writing here. He's clearly saying that God is our support system. He doesn't engineer our troubles. He's not trying to get us to fall. That's what the accuser does. And so he is not expecting us to stand up by our own strength and merits and make it through. And he's just watching to see, I'm going to be bringing you to heaven today? Well, let's find out. Let's see what it's like at sundown. No. That's not what he does. So the word persevere here to bring clarity is this. The person who withstands the temptation doesn't let the tribulation get the best of them. It's not about having victory over it so that they are stronger than. It's about how we triumph over the accuser. We triumph over the accuser by the what? Blood of the Lamb. The only one that could do what Adam and Eve couldn't is Jesus. So what does it mean to persevere? To not give up, even when I fail. To keep on hoping when things have taken a turn for the worst. To keep looking for the God of love when I am hearing the accusations. You're not good enough you're too much to handle. You deserve to be alone. It's all your fault. You see, when you are convinced that this is all true, that it's all that is true, that's when the God of love comes looking for you. Why are you blessed? Because the God of love comes looking for you. Jan uh, going again back to the uh, book of Genesis, chapter 3, the Lord God called out to the man, where are you? Where are you? Where are you right now? In the midst of their failure, when they dove for the bushes, God came looking for them. That's who God is. 
Does he say, why haven't I found you persevering here? I expected to come and see you having a 15-point doctrinal debate with the, Satan, with the devil. Instead, you're in the bushes. He knew that they had failed, and in the midst of their failure, that's when he comes searching for them. How can God hold on to us humans? How does he answer the accuser? Because love is what perfection, holiness comes from. Perfection and holiness come from love. All that is right, all that is good comes from love. Love gives itself to love. I give my life to you. You are more than enough. You're never too much. I want to be with you always. You don't need to listen to the accuser because he doesn't have all the truth. Why? Because he doesn't have you. The accuser doesn't have you. All he's got is his accusations. Does he got your heart? Nope. He doesn't have your heart. So he doesn't have all the truth. What's there in your heart? God says, I know that's what's true. That's what I've got to work with. That's what I love. So God persevered with failed humans. God endures the accuser day and night. God won't give up. That's why we're blessed when we find ourselves enduring and persevering because we're like we're right there on the same page with our God. God is faithful. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Whoa, what a beautiful promise that is. I love that verse. Again, we could read this verse in a certain type of way and say, see, you have no excuse for failure. No, 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 that's not what it's saying. It's saying that God loves you so much that he does not engineer anything that is going to cause you to walk away from him. And also along with this, he will not let you be tempted by anything that he won't come looking for you if you stumble. But when you are tempted, the Bible says here, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Now, this word endure, what it means is to literally stand up underneath it. You know, um, I've seen some pictures of Daniel Mulberg setting new personal records, doing his squats, the bars across his, the back of his neck, and he's got all those weights on the side of it. And he's got a bunch of teammates around him going, yeah, yeah, you can do it, yeah. And he goes down once, he comes back up, puts it up, whew, that was enough, right? <laughs> and that's a lot of weight, but that's, this, that's the picture of this word. You can stand up under it. What about when the weight's too much? You know, there's a way out, it says here. This is God's design. I'm going to be able to see a window of hope. It may not be the door or the escape hatch where I can just... Whew, I'm free. No, I'm still under it. It's still over me. I'm still carrying it. But I can see that there's something in the future for me that means release, that means freedom, that means justice. In other words, you can always see the hope that's ahead. And God says, that's my job. I won't let you be without that hope. I'll keep sending the message to you, people to you, letting you know. Because when you can't see that window, I want to be with you and get you to where you can see that window because that's how you can stand. That's how you can keep going. You see, James clarifies in chapter 1, verse 17, as we close, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of our heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. The trials themselves, God's not throwing them down at you, but every good and perfect gift is from above. The strength from a friend, the encouragement, the promise, the moment in which you know that you're not alone, finally. Something that shows that there is a way forward. God's behind all of that. And God says, I'm going to keep getting you up in the morning because that's my job. And I don't change. I don't change like shifting shadows. So we keep persevering with the God of love. We don't have to be perfect and many trials and temptations can come our way. They won't break our connection with the God who loves us so much 
that he gives us his very own life. We triumph by the blood of the Lamb.